Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate the uh, introduction and the invitation to talk about The Crossings in the Indian, as you mentioned, my first two novels. And what I'm going to do is tonight I'm going to talk about both of them. And they're both historical fiction and included in my discussion will be the challenges that I had in writing historical fiction. I'm going to start with The Crossings. Okay, The Crossings is a story of my father's. Okay, so this, this uh, novel was based on a story you can see. It, it says it's a young boy's daring adventure of courage, faith, and friendship. And I'll get to where all those factor in. So it's a true story based on my father, who in 1932, at the age of 12, hopped a freight train in Northern Kentucky and went to New Orleans to see Mardi Gras. Now, usually when I say that to people, they go, what? And I've had them do that when I've just been in conversation and I've had it at book shows and book clubs and all that stuff. So I'll say it again. In 1932, which was during the Great Depression, at age 12, he hopped a freight train in Northern Kentucky and he, ran, and he rode 1,100 miles down to New Orleans to see the Mardi Gras. So when I was growing up, he didn't talk that much about it, okay? And it was because it wasn't a very popular thing for him to have done at the time. So when he retired back in the 90s, he and I would have lunch occasionally, or actually we did and he I would ask him a question or two just in passing it wasn't a topic I wasn't a writer at the time and it was something that I was more interested in because when I was young my grandmother his mother would say wag, wag her finger at me and say don't you ever think about doing something like that and I'd say doing something like what I didn't know what she meant and then she would say you know hopping that a freight train and going to New Orleans. And I went, well, uh, that really wasn't on the top of my priority list. And uh, so I never thought that much more about it. But every time she'd bring something like that up, if my father was in a room, he happened to scamper out into the other room. And so I never really, he never really talked about it when I was young. So as I mentioned, when he passed away, we talked about it a little bit, but I wasn't a writer and I wasn't interviewing or anything like that. So based on the timeline, I knew how old he was. So I knew where he was going. I knew what it was, who it was, when it was, and where it was, because it was easy when, it, when somebody tells you 1932, um, going to New Orleans to see Mardi Gras, well, it's not that hard to look up what day of the week and all that that Ash Wednesday is on. So you can pretty much figure when Mardi Gras is. So the only thing I never knew was why he did it. When somebody says that a young boy, 12 year old boy does something like that, you always figure, oh, that's a big old, you know, lollygag type of a thing uh, to, for somebody to do something that crazy. So what I was able to do though is, fill in the blanks later. One of the most important things I want to mention about this book is the overarching storyline on it is who helped him on the way down, who helped him while he was there in New Orleans, and who helped him get back. Because we all know as a kid, even though you can't do something like that now, even in 1932 during the Great Depression, uh, it was pretty remarkable that he would do something like that and nobody would be able to do that by themselves. So a big part of his story had to do with Holy Cross Church in Latonia, Kentucky, which is one, one of the uh, sites of this story, which is the origin of the story. He went to Holy Cross Church and school and his best buddy there was Schmitty, you know, who's a character in the story as well. And they had a, a nun there, Sister Adelaide, who was the sacristan of the church. 
and my, and my dad was an altar boy and whatnot. And so he was always proud. He talked about Sister Adelaide a lot, the influence that she had on him. And she had a big influence on a lot of people or a lot of boys there. And he always talked about the fact that he wanted to be one of Sister Adelaide's boys. Okay, and in order to do that, in order to be an older boy, you had to have good conduct and you had to have good grades and, 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 and be a good practicing Catholic and whatnot. But, you know, that was sometimes difficult for him. And so he often got on the wrong side of her, but he was always trying to be on her good side because of how important it was to him to be one of her, her boys. But then with him and Schmidt, being around in Latonia, Kentucky, they were kind of two two of the guys that were would hang out at Riddy's Corner in there, and the, and the guys and they'd be out swimming in the uh, in the uh, Banklet Creek, and they were pretty much just regular goofing off kind of young guys. But then my my father suffered a crushing blow when his father abandoned the family. And that's when his whole life changed because he then became the man of the house to help out his mother and his sister. Uh, her mother wasn't working. She was unemployed in, in the depression and whatnot. And so my dad, who in the story we called Georgie, he had to get deliver newspapers in the morning and, and had to set uh, pins at the bowling alley at night and do odd jobs in order to help make ends meet. So. There is a chapter, and he also endured teasing from the kids at school because his father had walked out. At the same time, during the Great Depression, there was a lot more fathers that abandoned families than people realized, but evidently not so much there in Latonia because he really uh, got a, a teasing from a lot of his classmates and kids on the playground. So there is a chapter in the book called Abandoned, and in it is where I described the event of when his father left, and I had I got I had a lot of details for that chapter, and it is a real tearjerker because my father at one of our lunches he had described it to me when the event happened and how it happened and so on, and at the time when he was talking to me about it, he had tears running down his face. So after when I was trying to think of this whole storyline after. I remembered his story about that. Then I knew that was the why. He was having trouble with the pressures of being the man of the house and all the responsibilities that came with that. And so that's more than likely what caused him to just to say, I got to get out of here. I can't take this anymore. And I'm going to do something and, and go to the Mardi Gras. One of the big influences in Latonia and in, and in my dad and his life was Latonia Racetrack and few people even knew anymore what Latonia Racetrack was in northern Kentucky but as we all know Kentucky's big on horse racing and pretty much every young boy in the state has horse racing in their blood and Latonia Racetrack as you can see from this picture was a really big time place in fact, it rivaled Churchill Downs, and in the early days of Latonia Racetrack, there would be horses and owners, trainers, that would skip the Kentucky Derby to come up and run in the Latonia Derby that was typically run uh, around uh, Memorial Day. And you can see by this picture of all the well-to-do people and all that hung out at that racetrack and enjoyed racing. Now, as far as uh, Georgie and Schmidt were concerned, this was like a magnet to them because they loved to go hang out there and meet jockeys and trainers and all that stuff. And they even, my dad would talk about Eddie Arcaro, who was one of the, nation's top jockeys for years and years he was a rode on a kentucky derby winner and he what he would do is they would go out and when the horses weren't running on a on an off day on a track 
I, my mother told me that when my father was young, he would go out and run on the track. Well, that is until he got thrown off. So the Tonya racetrack was a big thing and it comes up a number of times in the crossings. Meanwhile, back at the train yard, uh, this is a picture of the Corsi yard where, where my dad hopped the train to go to New Orleans. And just to give you, you know, from this picture, you can see, yeah, it's a freight, it's a freight yard, a train yard. But this is, even though this picture is a little grainy, it shows the immense, it shows the immensity of the yard. In fact, one time, uh, I, I, on the photo, I counted the tracks and it was 48 tracks wide, which was over a quarter mile wide. Nowadays, it's not so big. It might be about four uh, tracks wide. But what I had to do from a research position was I had to study everything I could about the railroad because when it comes to a story like somebody going 1,100 miles from one place to another on a freight train, it's like you just can't you know, that can't just be a couple pages. That's the whole story. So in order to figure out, well, how could something like that happen? I read a number of books on the LNN Railroad because it was the LNN Railroad that he went down there on. And I read those books to figure out, you know, how to do it and, and, and what all would go on on a train. But the other thing where I really, if you want to say lucked out, is I found a train schedule for a freight train. And I didn't even know freight trains had schedules because passengers don't ride them. So I don't know who would know about it other than conductors and engineers. But in one of the books I read, there was a, a schedule for a freight train that ran from the De Courcy yard down to New Orleans. And it was in the same year as the setting for this book. So I was like, I felt like I hit the lottery when I found that because that gave me so much information about the route of the train, what what uh, rail yards it stopped in, how long it was there. I was able to know then if a train was at some place for 15 minutes, I knew it was just there for water and coal as opposed to if it was in a yard for two or three yards, which would be switching cars or picking up new freight and, and doing all that, that that they do on trains. So that was really a big thing uh, for me, which really helped. And the other thing that I had done is I had traced the route on Google Earth because this is a this is a car like what uh, Georgie would have ridden in on the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And at that time it was called Old Reliable. And so when I thought about it, I thought, boy, those rails are probably in the same place that they were back in 1932. So I got on Google Earth and, and traced the tracks by going down and finding the tracks in, that, in the yard at, in DeCourcy and then dropping the altitude on Google Earth down to 200 feet and scanning it all the way down to New Orleans. Now, this took me about a month in the evenings to do this because it is very time consuming because it's not like you're zooming down those rails at 100 miles an hour. You're going slow so that you can pick up all the details. And, but at the same time, what it did is I was able to see where all the tunnels and streams and rivers and mountains and valleys and all that was, and that really helped out. Now, when it comes to hopping a freight train, I had to study how you did that, which is really, you know, one of those things that you never figure you have to do. But if you're writing historical fiction, you can't, you got to be realistic. And one of the things that I, that was of real concern to me is like you see on this picture, there's these latches on the cars. I had to figure out how somebody could ride in a car and not accidentally be locked because if they were they would survive. So I had to come up with ways of keeping that door just ajar a little bit. And I did that by saying they jammed a rock in the track of the door. I don't think these two guys watched a training video on how to hop on a train, but nevertheless, they're giving it their go. In my research, I read that 
a lot of guys fell off trains and ended up with legs and arms and things cut off. So hopefully that didn't happen to these two guys. One of my favorite things to write about was hobos. In order to do that, I started out, I read a, I think a couple small books on hobo slang, which you don't realize all the vernacular they used. And, and, uh, but, and it was really interesting because I incorporated a lot of that into the writing. I had written a chapter called The Jungle, and that's what hobo camps were called. And in order to figure out where they are, I had to find a rail yard that was close by, and I had to find a water source because that's something that they'd need to survive. Because a hobo can't jump a train when it's going full throttle. They either have to get on in a friendly yard or get on, jump on when a train is really going slowly down the track. When I did my research for hobo camps, and I think part of it was I started just brushing up on, well, gee, what are, what's that all about? So when I was reading up on it, I got so excited. I had all these ideas rolling around in my head about, oh, this is so cool. This is really going to be a great write that I went ahead and wrote that chapter first. It ends up being chapter 10 in the book, okay? And I, it may have been a beginner's mistake to write a chapter 10 first, but, but when you feel inspired, you feel like, oh, I gotta get this written down. So I wrote that chapter and it's a cool chapter because a lot of the hobos in there are trying to convince Georgie to turn around and go back, that it's too dangerous to do what you're trying to do and you need to turn around and go back. And one of the big characters in there is a guy named Buster. And when people talk about hobos, hobos were people that a lot of times were just migrant workers moving from one location to the other. And they just used the uh, railroad for cheap transportation to get where they were going. Some of the guys, eh, sometimes they were trying to run from the law and whatnot, but for the most part, they were all pretty good guys. And so a lot of them were trying to convince Georgie to turn around. And that's where it gets back to where uh, I said earlier, that it's the stories about who helped him in the beginning, who helped him on the way, that was hobos and guys on the train that were trying to take care of him on the way, who helped him while he was down there and who helped him back. Now, when it came to this being chapter 10, the hard part for me was trying to fit it in somewhere because of the geographical things that are necessary. And so I finally did and got it to work and it was in a jungle hobo camp down in Alabama and it worked out best there because I found a place where the, there was a rail yard in Montgomery, Alabama. There was a, a creek and a river nearby. And also it takes three days on a train to ride to New Orleans. And after about a day and a half, Georgie needed a break and he wanted to get off the train. So he did. So the, the thing I'm always gonna remember, and I think someday I might write an article, don't write chapter 10 first. These guys are what they call railroad detectives or bull. Okay, look pretty dapper there, but they were really nasty guys. And in fact, they they ruled the railroad then because they, some of them were in charge of different rail yards, and so they were always looking for guys riding the trains that weren't supposed to be. And then uh, when they would catch somebody they would really work them over. They had their black jacks and, and whatnot. And if they caught you, they'd haul you off to jail. And in the meantime, when they were taking you away, they'd steal any money that you had on, on you. So they were a, a motley crew to deal with. They looked dapper here. They didn't act so much and when they were doing their job. And in the story, Georgie has a few interactions with them, which was fun to write. Some of the research I had to do, had to do with uh, Mardi Gras itself down there in 1932, uh, a lot different then than it is now. There was, this was on Canal Street, which is a big crowd. This is on one of the side streets, because in 1932, you have, there's always a lot of little uh, praise going on and, and all down, and parties going on down in New Orleans, but this is a lot of what it looked like back in 1932. Not so much how it looks today, but I didn't really have to do research on 
how it looked today, which I was happy not to have to do. While he was in New Orleans, he frequented Jackson Square, which Jack, General Jackson was very popular down in New Orleans because he was a big hero in the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812, where he defeated the British. He has a big influence down there. In the background is St. Louis Cathedral. And in my discussions uh, with my dad, uh, when we would have lunch, he always, he traveled to New Orleans quite a bit. And he said that he always wanted to go to high mass at St. Louis Cathedral on Ash Wednesday. So I knew when I wrote the story, I had to get him to St. Louis Cathedral. Now, in my research, and there's a lot of times when you do research, you get hung in on these little bitty details that other people might say, what are you worrying about that for? But that was just me. I like doing, I like history and I like doing research. So when I was looking at some pictures of St. Louis Cathedral on the inside, just looking for something like, gee, that might be interesting. I noticed these flags hanging in a church and I'm like, man, that's really different. I'd never heard of having flags because they, they don't look like religious flags. They look like country's flags and so I thought about it and I go I did research but I couldn't find anywhere where that was described and I found the you know articles and things about the architectural things but nothing about those flags so I thought I'm going to take a long shot and I called the Archdiocese of Louisville to ask them about it and so I got on the phone with uh, with a lady and I told her what I was trying to find out how long had those flags been there and it was like uh, let me get back to you on that. So she did. In fact, uh, she called me back like the next day and said, I talked to the chancellor and he's been here since 1960 and they were always there when he was there. So I thought, well, if the chancellor doesn't know if they weren't there in 1932, who would? So I decided I'm going to put it in there. And, I, and all that research that I spent, that time calling and looking up things, it all ended up being just one sentence in the book where I mentioned that they hung in permanent salute to the different countries that had had uh, uh, dominance or had ruled over the Louisiana Territory. I think I just did it for me, to tell you the truth. Another part of New Orleans that, that was in the book was... St. Louis Cemetery. The hobos, when they were trying to convince Georgie to turn around as the city of the dead, and they said, because of all the little houses that hold the dead people. Well, I was down in New Orleans doing research for this story, and I was, happened to be at St. Louis Cemetery, in which case that's why I included a story on it in the book. And when I was down there, uh, I, unfortunately, I had to cut my, my travel short because I got chased out by Hurricane Ike. But nevertheless, I had enough time to go through that cemetery and I saw one of those little crypts there that had a plaque on it that said that 160 nuns were buried in there and it had every one of their names and they went back maybe 100 years. And I thought, holy cow, how could they get all those nuns into something like that? because it didn't indicate they were cremated because those things were hardly any bigger. A lot of them are hardly any bigger than a shed in your backyard where you got your mower and your garden stuff. So I realized on doing more research after I got back that the way they do it a lot down there is you sort of rent space in a crypt and like a family might own a crypt. And so you're in that spot for maybe 25 years and then they go and they either they open it up and put your bones in a bone box or just take a rake and push your bones to the back and then bury the next family member or so in the front. Well, that's a heck of a job. I don't think I'd want that job for sure. But what I had done is there's so much history and they claim that those cemeteries are haunted, which is very possible, that uh, I had a story, one of the, a scene in one of the chapters where uh, Georgie's, Georgie's getting chased by hooligans and he ends up having to spend the night uh, running from those guys and hiding out right by one of the crypts. In fact, in, at dawn, 
he mentions when the sun comes up he mentions that he has been leaning up against the crypt that holds the remains of 160 nuns and i tried to draw a little comparison to like that he felt that sister adelaide from up at home was actually looking after him when i mentioned all the people that helped him up uh on the way down while he's down here this is one of the this is one of the guys that helped him when i when he's down here and i developed a character starting from this photograph and in the book his name is mr hansen and i happened to find a picture of a guy that was sitting on a park bench in jackson square and i had mentioned you know that part of the book is there are scenes from jackson square so um he was a guy that ended up giving george a lot of advice because he had had some hard times in his own life and george spent an evening and a dinner with him of course in the book uh, i cleaned him up a little bit i had him that he was well trimmed and a and a bowler hat and a nice suit on and all that stuff uh and a walking cane just just for the effect of it in there so that he so that he actually looked like a good character but this is this was the start of mr hansen so the end here for the crossings is you see the the train in the caboose where he ends up going back and in, in the help he got even on the way back and I'm not gonna you know I don't want to spoil the book in case you want to purchase it which I'm hoping you would but a couple things I wanted to mention one is that after I wrote the crossings I had people come up to me and tell me that their father when he was a teenager had done the same thing that I had written about with Georgie None of them mentioned that they came out of the De Courcy yard in, in Northern Kentucky, but one of them told me that his father came out of a, of a yard in Cincinnati in Marymount and as a teenager went down to New Orleans. I, and, and it was more than one of them that told me that they had done that same thing. And in fact, the one guy that told me that his father came out of Cincinnati and went down there told me that the bulls got him on and uh, throw him in the clink. So uh, I was glad that didn't happen to Georgie, but uh, it was really interesting that I always told people, I said, well, I didn't know about those stories. I wish, I guess I wish I would have known those stories before I wrote the book, because uh, I might've had some more interesting details to write, but um, I always said I was just the lucky guy that wrote the story. They all had great stories they were telling me. The other thing is on the research that I did, I had people tell me that have they vacation in New Orleans and all that. They told me how excellent the research was, how accurate it was. And I had another guy that I work with that went on vacation down there and they said they took the crossings with them in order to visit all the spots that I had described. And they said how much they really appreciated it. And it really added a lot to their trip. So. Those, those are all nice things to find out because when you write historical fiction, you're always worried about, did you, are you inaccurate, are you accurate, and, and how much does that influence the story to help it make a better story. I'd like to talk about the Indian. Now, the Indian is the sequel to The Crossings, okay? And it's got the same characters, except this time it's George now, not Georgie, because they're grown up. This takes uh, place eight years after the 1932 story. So this is 1940. And so Schmidt is the primary character and Georgie is his uh, sidekick, or George, I should say, now that he's 20 years old. So when I was trying to figure out, you know, the, the crossings had been so successful with people that everybody was asking me, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? I thought, man, it had won a lot of awards and people liked it. And I thought, man, I need to up my game um, so that I just didn't look like a one and done guy. So I was thinking long and hard about something. And I thought, okay, 1940, right before World War II, that's a good time frame. You know, 20-year-old uh, guys can be pretty enterprising and do some pretty interesting things. One day I was watching the History Channel, 
and Mike Wolf was on there, and he is in love with Indian motorcycles, especially old ones. So I happened to be watching it, and I said, that's exactly it. A motorcycle is something that I can really get some 20-year-olds interested in and really taking it somewhere. So I thought that's the direction I'm going in. So what I did is I did research, and I found pictures of this motorcycle, which is an Indian motorcycle. And Indian was a big name back in those days, and it really still is, but it's the company has changed hands once. But this is a 1915 Indian Big Twin, and it's called a Big Twin because of the two cylinders. And you can see them in the center of the motorcycle there, uh, and, there and there's what drives it and gives it the kind of running power that it has. So it's now, as I mentioned, 1940, and George and Smitty are right on the cusp of World War II. So they're trying to figure out how that is going to affect their lives. So in the meantime, the story starts, where else? Back at Latonia Racetrack. Now, Latonia Racetrack isn't what it was because during the Great Depression, it ended up going out of business in 1939. So the story begins in 1940, and Schmidt is on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. And even though the track was shut down, it was still in pretty decent shape in 1940. So he and another guy on a Triumph motorcycle decided they were going to race, and pretty much for bragging rights in, in Latonia. So they took off, and George was the one that was watching him. He didn't have a motorcycle, so he couldn't race against uh, Schmidt on his uh, Harley. So just about the time that Schmidt is running, and he's running away with the race, right when he gets near the finish line, his motorcycle crashes, which really didn't make any sense to anybody else because he was an experienced rider, but the front wheel turned sideways, and he crashed, and the other guy won. So while they couldn't drive, um, he and George took it home, you know, maybe the half mile or three quarters of a mile home. So they're pushing it and dragging it and hauling it down the street. And they go past a house where a guy's cleaning out the garage in his, in his yard. And he's got this awesome looking 1915 of big twin Harley motor or uh, Indian motorcycle. So they stop in and start chatting with a guy and saying, wow, we saw this motorcycle. It looks unbelievable. It looks brand new. And, and uh, he said, well, he says, it's not new. He says it was my sons who was killed in World War II. So there's a sad story about that. And so Smitty is just blown away by the motorcycle because like I said it looks like it's in showroom condition which they couldn't figure out why and it had sat there like 25 years after it was killed in World War II so they throw a little gas in a little oil and they get it running which was you know hard to believe and so like I say Schmitty's in love with it and the man ends up giving it to him so he comes home with it in the meantime He's in UC, the University of Cincinnati, in the engineering school. He was the more studious of the two. And George, uh, after high school, is working at the uh, Andrew Steel Mill in Newport, Kentucky. Now, right there on the Licking River, which is in Northern Kentucky. So the thing is, what the, odd, the ironic part about it is George is working in the steel mill, which was where his father worked before he abandoned their family. So he didn't like the fact that when he worked there, people said, oh yeah, this is Pat's boy. He didn't want to be Pat's boy. He wanted to be his own guy. Still, ironically, his job in that steel mill was running the locomotive in their rail yard there for the, for moving the steel and the coal into the mill and so on and so forth. So as you saw in the crossings, he had trains in his blood and he still had trains in his blood. And it, and in actuality, he had that trains, trains in his blood until 1998 when he passed away. 
So when he and I, when he, when I was young and he and I would be driving somewhere in the car, there was a number of times when he'd say, Hey, let's stop here. And he and I would walk out on an overpass or a bridge and watch the trains pass underneath with the, the smoke belching out of them and all that stuff. And I remember going home and my mother would look at me and say, I know where you were. And I said, well, how can you tell? And she says, because your face is all full of soot. So as I said, he had trains in his blood his whole life. In fact, one time uh, he called me up before he passed away and said, I'm going to, uh, I'm leaving tomorrow to go to Australia. And I said, you're doing what? He says, I'm going to Australia. And I said, what are you going to Australia for? He goes, I want to ride a train across the outback. Sure enough, he went to Australia by himself and rode a train across the outback. So this is George and Schmitty trying, as I said, they're trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. So Schmitty decides it's, it's, he's going to take a ride on the Indian and go across country because he wants to go to Mount Rushmore because that was such a great engineering feat. He's an engineering student. He wanted George to go with him, the Harley there, but George couldn't go because he was working at the steel mill and didn't want to take a chance on losing his job by taking off because he was still the sole support for his mother and his sister. So Schmidt, as I said, takes off to go across the country. And I had to figure out how to get him there. And when, you, when I say that, I mean, there was no interstate system. So I had to do research on all the side roads and the back roads and the U.S. routes and all that to see how to get there. Now, granted, it's easier today checking things out online. But at the same time, you had to figure out what cities he was going to hit and what kind of storylines you could develop depending on where he was on the route. So as it turns out, he went across the United States to South Dakota, where Mount Rushmore is, and he had to cross the Badlands. Now, when I started doing research on the Badlands, and I came on to them when I was looking on Google Earth, because I never knew much about the Badlands, I thought the name had to do with where, you know, the Cowboys and Indians were fighting each other, and that's why they call it Badlands, but that's not why they did. The Indians gave it that name because it really wasn't worth much other than looking nice. You couldn't do much with it. So he goes across the country and hits the Badlands, which they actually, the Indians named it Terra Seca, which means uh, land bad. And so Schmidt goes and hits Sturgis where he wanted to go see the motorcycle rally. It was in its infant years and he wanted to go there. Now this is really a nice place, don't you think Sturgis? However, when he's there, he meets a girl named Maggie, and he kind of was getting stuck on her, but she had a, 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 a old line boyfriend that was in the service in a way, so she wasn't uh, just playing along, so, so to speak. So while he was there, um, he stayed with and met Happy Hole, who was an Indian motorcycle dealer and actually was one of the people that started the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. So he ends up at Mount Rushmore, uh, rode there on the Indian motorcycle with Maggie. Now I'm sure they just went as friends. And while he was in Sturgis, he hooked up and met this uh, Indian named Dakota, who had a lot of advice for him and about life, including women and uh, but was a mysterious kind of guy because when he would meet with, uh, he would show up and meet with uh, Schmidt, and it would be at times when Schmidt was feeling kind of down about some different things, he would show up and give him advice. But whenever Schmidt talked about him to somebody else, they go, I didn't see any Indian, I don't know what you're talking about. So he was a mysterious character to say the least. So Schmidt returns home. And this is a picture of Riddy's Corner where he and, and uh, George would hang out. And uh, he decides that he's going to enlist in the Navy because he doesn't want to take a chance with World War II uh, coming down on him that he's going to be drafted into the Army. And he didn't have control over his future. So 
he wanted to be a, a study to be a navigator on a plane. So as it turned out, since the war in Europe was going on, as far as the uh, United States helping Britain and other countries over there, they had all the pilots in use, so to speak, over there. So they needed more pilots. And since Schmidt was at the top of his class in engineering, they decided, hey, why don't you be a pilot? And he decided to go ahead and be a pilot. So one of the research things that I had to do was, in addition to figuring out how different how a motorcycle a 1915 motorcycle runs on a different carburetor and all that i had to figure out what all you studied to be a navigator and then also how, what what all you had to study to be a pilot and then it, i had to learn all the inner workings of a of a b17 including what all the crew members did and the bombardiers and and the co-pilots and, and the fuel ranges that they had, because when you're out there flying in the Pacific, it's not like you're flying a couple hundred miles from one island to the other. It's thousands of miles from one island to another. So in order to be realistic, I couldn't just say that, you know, they flew from Hawaii to the Marshall Islands and da 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 when in fact a plane couldn't make it that far. And so I remember one time, I was having trouble figuring it out. So I just said they put auxiliary fuel tanks on this plane and that's how they got there. You got to be creative for sure. So then World War II breaks out and here's George in his uniform. And so he enlists in the Navy uh, right after. And, and I remember him telling me the story about that, how he went over to Cincinnati at Government Square and they were lined up for three blocks, four, four wide on the sidewalk to enlist in the Navy. So he ends up in uh, World War II on this destroyer, uh, the USS Anderson, DD-411. And he ends up out also out there in the South Pacific at Pearl Harbor with uh, Schmidt. So uh, there was a number of things I wrote in the, in the book about those two getting together when they could and uh, just talking about everything from what's going on back home to how is this war going to affect the rest of our lives and what are we going to do after the war and, and just the regular things guys would talk about. So one of the, when it comes to research, one of the cool things that I found is in my father's uh, effects is he wrote a letter to my grandmother. It was like five pages long on Christmas day, 1943. And one of the things he says is, I'm sorry I haven't written for six months, but here's what's all gone on. And he wrote about the different battles that the Anderson was in. And he wrote about things about how uh, a shell hit the command information center on their boat and killed the captain and, uh, so on and so forth. And so it was really cool to find this letter because when you read something that's as old as it is, and it's, I don't know, the, with the, the yellowed paper, it's almost like parchment or something. Uh, it really makes you, uh, it really makes you feel like you're really into the story, especially when my father had written it. So this is a picture of a World War II hero B-17 pilot. And his name is John Cleet. And I happen to know him because he's an attorney that worked in the same building as I did. And we ended up, after a point in time, working on the same floor. And we had crossed paths for, I don't know, 25 years, I guess, and would say hi and whatnot. And then when we worked on the same floor, one day I was walking down the hall, going to the men's room, and he came out of his office uh, and he said in a gruff voice, I'm reading your book. I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I got a, a, a war hero B-17 pilot reading my book about how you fly a B-17 and all the details about a B-17 and everything. I'm like, oh, my God, I hope he never brings that up again. So it must have been a month later. I ran into him again in the hall. And he had his attendant with him because he was elderly and he needed help getting around. And so I said, he says to me, he goes, I finished your book. 
and I went being cordial. I didn't know what to say. So I just said, well, I hope you enjoyed it. And he looks at me and he starts laughing. And I'm like, my heart sank. I'm figuring, oh my God, I can't, oh, what's he going to say now? And he looks me straight in the eye and he says, I thought you were writing about me. I crashed one too. And I thought, oh my God, you talk about, you know, a seal of approval on research is when you have somebody like that that actually flew one of those things, one of those planes, tells you that he thought I was writing about him. And his attendant that would help him get around told me, he, he, he whispered to me and he said, he loved every word of it. He says he made me read it to him every day at lunchtime. And I really, it really buoyed my spirits when I heard that. And uh, Mr. Cleet uh, passed away a couple years when he was 100 years old. He was really a great man. I'm, I'm glad I got to know him. The crossings in the Indian is, has, have won a few awards. And the favorite one is, and it says 2015, the one at the top on the right was a grand prize winner in the Great Southeast Book Festival. It was fun to win a grand prize on your first book. And it was also fun to win a $1,500 grand prize award and a, an airline ticket to go to Hollywood to get the award. So my wife and I flew out there and it was fun being at the historic Roosevelt Hotel uh, to get the award and to stay where the first Academy Awards were presented, which is actually right across the street from the Dolby Center uh, where, where the awards are given now. So if you want to buy an autographed copy of either of the books, you can get them at www.headlinebooks.com, which is selling them now at no shipping costs, or you can visit my website at www.barrykbooks.com. I want to thank you all for tuning in, uh, either on uh, Zoom or Facebook Live, to hear my presentation of the Indian and the Crossings. Thank you. Mm -hmm.